Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today we're looking into how much RAM you need to play the latest and greatest gaming titles with nice silky smooth frame rates. It's about this time each year that I do set out on a memory capacity related quest. Last year I concluded by saying the following. 8GB should be the minimum standard while 16GB is desirable but not needed. For general usage and gaming there is no advantage to be had by using 16GB or more RAM. I suspect a year later this still holds true, but we have seen a few games recently sneaking past 8GB of allocated memory, so I thought it was probably worth looking into again. I have to say though, there was one comment I noticed from last year's uh, written article that does sting a bit today. That comment being, system memory has hit new lows in 2016, which makes it very accessible even in budget builds. Uh, well, yeah, that's no longer the case. So I suspect those of you with 8 gigabytes of memory that do feel that they have to upgrade will probably just wait till later next year when pricing comes down. Ho hopefully comes down. When it comes to games, testing the impact of memory or RAM capacity is no easy task and there are many factors at play here. Before we get into the results, I would like to just discuss a few of the challenges faced when doing this kind of testing. The first and possibly biggest challenge is picking the right hardware. Now what kind of graphics card you use can very much influence the amount of memory that you'll need for smooth gameplay. Uh, likewise, the speed of your storage device can also impact the end result. For example, the GTX 1063 gigabyte will often see higher system memory usage than the 6GB model, as at times you will run out of VRAM and as a result system memory will be used. If you then happen to run out of system memory, some game assets are moved to local storage. This means something like a hard drive or hopefully an SSD. And depending on how fast that device is and how heavily it's hit with data, you may or may not see a noticeable dip in frame rate. So testing with a GeForce GTX 1080 Ti and its 11 gigabyte VRAM buffer, along with a super snappy NVMe SSD, probably isn't the best way to determine how much system memory your average gamer will require. I'd also assume that if you have a $700 US graphics card and potentially a primary storage device of similar value, then buying 16 gigabytes or more of system memory or RAM probably isn't really a big issue. There are other factors to consider as well. For example, memory speed can also influence the results. Uh, granted, even the fastest memory, I think, say, DDR4-4000, that can't make up for a lack of capacity, not entirely, but in some instances when working with large volumes of, say, broken up data, it can help to avoid slowdowns as the data is moved in and out of the system memory much quicker. The quality settings used in games can also really impact the results. If you use a GeForce GTX 1063GB for example, but are happy to turn things down like textures uh, to sort of like a, a medium type quality setting, then that will reduce how much data is offloaded to the system memory. Taking all of this into account, I've tested a number of different hardware configurations and I'll be showing the impact that all this has on performance. However, I quickly discovered another issue when trying to show the FPS difference between the various hardware configurations. Now, benchmark passes typically last anywhere from say 30 to 60 seconds, depending on how the benchmark it tests. And Generally, they are based on multiple runs. All the benchmarking on Harbour Unbox, for example, is based on a three-run average. This means the system does have a chance to cache the pass by keeping just the data we're accessing over and over again in that 30 to 60 second pass, and it can store that in high speed memory. So while the results for the very first run might see a shockingly low 0.1% uh, or 1% frame time figure when using uh, a limited amount of system memory, this result can be improved dramatically on the second run and then again on the third. So displaying a three run average here can be quite misleading. The best solution that I came up with to work around this problem was to run each benchmark once, then reset the entire system, load the game again, and then run the next pass. The result being that the 30 second pass for each test doesn't have the chance to be cached. Uh, the benchmark pass is actually 60 seconds in total, but I only report the frame rates for the last 30 seconds. Now, this mimics more what you'd see when playing the game. For the first, say, initial 5 to 10 seconds, the game can still be loading assets as you play, and this can cause frame drops, even on computers with sufficient system memory. 
Finally, benchmarks aside, a good indicator of working at how much memory you'll need to play the latest and greatest titles is just to monitor memory allocation. Now, this probably isn't something that you can really do because if you only have eight gigabytes, you can't monitor if the game's going to use more than that because it just gets moved to the page file. Uh, but for me, I can install, in this case, 32 gigabytes of memory, and we can see how much of that each of these games will use to see if you do need up to 32 gigabytes. It's not a foolproof method, uh, but it does give us a pretty good idea of how much system memory a game will require to avoid any slowdowns. Again, the hardware used will impact the amount of system memory used. So having said all that, I'm first going to show you memory usage using three different graphics cards and a few popular modern titles. All gameplay tests were conducted on the Core i7-8700K with 32GB of DDR4-3000 memory. And by using a large memory buffer, we can see how much system memory each game and hardware configuration can use when it's not limited by how much system memory you have, or not heavily limited. Uh, and this isn't a completely sanitized test system either. There are many applications running in the background, such as Steam, Origin, Uplay, uh, there's Discord, Chrome with a few tabs open, uh, MSI Afterburner, uh, Reva Tuner, and Fraps. And all these applications are open with the same amount of tabs or whatever open for every single test. So as I said, this is by no means a completely clean test system running a skeleton crew of applications and processes. Also, please note that the maps used to test each game aren't the same every time. We're just testing multiplayer, and I did a lot of different map testing and stuff, so I'm just grabbing some random footage to show you what I saw for the most part. Starting with the 64-player Battlefield 1 match using the GeForce GTX 1080 Ti at 1440p with the ultra-quality preset, we see that up to 8.2 gigabytes of system memory is being used. The system page file grows to 11.6 gigabytes in size, and at this resolution and quality settings sees 3.8 gigabytes of VRAM consumed. The 1080 Ti though does of course have an 11 gigabyte VRAM capacity. So this does suggest for perfectly smooth performance in this title, gamers will require 16 gigabytes of system memory. Dropping down to the GeForce GTX 1060 6GB graphics card under the same test conditions, we see that RAM usage peaked a little higher at 8.5GB, and the system page file grew ever so slightly to 12GB. Again, we're seeing around 3.6GB worth of VRAM allocation. Now, if we use a graphics card with a VRAM buffer that's smaller than the amount of memory the game wants to allocate, this happens. With the GeForce GTX 1060 3GB, we see RAM usage hit 10GB, while the page file grows to 12.5GB, and as a result, we did occasionally see dips in the frame rate. That said, for the most part, the game was still quite smooth and very playable, thanks to the fact that we do have a massive 32GB of system memory installed. But whereas you might have gotten away with 8GB using a GTX 1080 Ti, you most certainly will require 16GB, with a graphics card sporting less than a 4 gigabyte frame buffer. That said, the 3 gigabyte 1060 is really intended for 1080p gameplay, but even lowering the resolution of 1080p still sees RAM usage peak at 9.7 gigabytes, even though for the most part the game's only allocating around 2.6 gigabytes of VRAM. For the rest of the games, I'll just quickly summarize what I saw. For Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, the GTX 1080 Ti saw 7.5 gigabytes of system memory used, and throughout my testing at 1440p using the ultra quality preset, the VRAM peaked at 6.2 gigabytes. This meant with the 6 gigabyte 1060 RAM allocation did climb to 8.3 gigabytes, and the page file also grew a bit to 14.5 gigabytes. Then with the 3GB version of the GTX 1060, RAM allocation boiled over to 12GB and reducing the resolution to 1080p didn't help as we still hit 12GB on the system memory. Now for the ultimate memory pick, Call of Duty World War II. Using the extra quality settings at 1440p, we see that the GTX 1080 Ti VRAM usage peaks at 10.8 gigabytes, and that's pretty much maxed out, and we saw the RAM allocation hit 10 gigabytes. Wow. Interestingly, RAM usage with the GTX 1060, a 6 gigabyte, was much the same, as was the page file size. The comparison though unfortunately wasn't made on the same map, but I did try multiple maps and I did see similar usage. Even with a 3GB GTX 1060, which was tested on the same map as the GTX 1080 Ti, we do see similar system memory usage, but 
frame drops were much more apparent now. Dropping down to 1080p didn't really seem to help either. Gamers using a 3 gigabyte 1060 will need to lower the quality settings. Things like texture quality will need to be lowered from the extra that we have it on to something less demanding. Maybe normal would be more appropriate here. Moving on, we have Overwatch, and this is a hugely popular and very high quality game, even if it's not super high quality in terms of visuals and textures. Here we see at 1440p, the GTX 1080 Ti only saw up to 2.4 gigabytes of VRAM usage while the system memory hit just 6.9 gigabytes. So eight gigabytes of RAM will be fine for this hardware configuration in Overwatch. We do see similar usage patterns with the GTX 1066GB, system memory usage peaked at just 7GB, so again 8GB of RAM will work well here for this title. That said, the 3GB 1060, you are pretty much right on the edge, RAM allocation did hit 7.5GB in my test and we did see much the same at 1080p as well. Finally, I monitored system memory usage when playing Star Wars Battlefront 2, and no, I didn't get any extra system memory in a loot box. Using the GTX 1080 Ti at 1440p with the maximum in-game quality settings, system memory usage hit 9.2GB, so this is yet another title that will want 16GB of system memory. Oddly, dropping down to the 6GB GTX 1060 reduced memory allocation to a peak of 8.5GB. I did retest this a few times and found the same result each time. That said though, with the 3GB 1060 RAM allocation shot up to 10.5GB, so with this graphics card you will certainly want 16GB of system memory, even at 1080p usage still rose above 10GB. Okay, so we've looked at how much system memory a few of the more popular games released this year are using with three different graphics cards. What I want to compare now is the GeForce GTX 1060 3GB and 6GB graphics cards to see how they compare with 4GB, 8GB, 16GB and 32GB of RAM. Again, I'm using a Core i7 8700K and the memory speed and timings are the same for each capacity. The only major difference being that I was forced to test the 4GB capacity with a single 4GB stick, and this meant using single channel memory. I don't have 2GB DDR4 memory modules, and since I already know that 4GB isn't enough to play these games, I didn't really want to waste any money or time trying to acquire a dual channel kit. But still be aware that the 4GB capacity is tested in single channel mode. First up we have Assassin's Creed Origins and these results were recorded using the very high quality preset at 1080p. Starting with the GeForce GTX 1060 6GB, we see that the 16GB and 32GB memory configurations allow for maximum performance to be extracted in this title. Interestingly, while the same average frame rate is achieved with 8GB, we see a noteworthy drop in the frame time performance. Up to a 10% drop can be seen. Then unsurprisingly, with just 4GB of system memory, the game completely tanks, and although the average frame rate looks good, the game is now very stuttery as indicated by the the 0.1% result. Similar performance trends are seen in this title with the 3GB 1060. Surprisingly though, the impact the 8GB configuration has on performance is less severe. I was expecting to find the opposite. Anyway, we are seeing that for maximum performance, you will want 16GB, while 8GB is definitely the bare minimum. Jumping to 1440p, we find that the 1066GB is now more limited by its own capabilities than the 8GB system memory capacity when looking at the 1% low result. That said, with just 4GB around, the performance is now disastrous. At the high resolution, the 3GB 1060 takes a big hit with 8GB of RAM, and things of course get even worse with just 4GB. Next up we have the Battlefield 1 results, and here I am using the single player portion of the game as the multiplayer portion can't be benchmarked accurately and is therefore useless for this kind of FPS comparison. Here the GTX 1060 6GB was able to deliver the same performance with 8GB, 16GB and 32GB of memory. We only see a small decline in performance with 4GB, which is surprising. That said though, we are only testing at 1080p. Using the 3GB 1060 does see a rather major decline in performance with 8GB of memory when looking at the frame time results. This is of course amplified further with 4GB, though again, not as severely as I would have expected. Increasing the resolution to 1440p, and now we see the 4GB system memory capacity causes all kinds of issues with the 6GB 1060. Stuttering was extremely noticeable. The same was found with the 3GB 1060 and now we're also seeing a drop in performance with 8GB of memory. 
Finally, I decided to test the ultimate memory pig, Call of Duty World War II. Using the GTX 1060 6GB, we see that the 16GB and 32GB memory capacities allow for maximum performance. Dropping down to just 8GB of memory though, does hit performance quite hard, especially those 0.1% frame time results, which are now 13% lower. Using just 4GB was again a complete disaster and the game became completely unplayable. The 1063GB on the other hand just doesn't have enough VRAM to play Call of Duty World War 2 at 1080p using the extreme quality settings. It's not the end of the world and while some will make a big deal out of this, lowering a few select quality settings will improve things out of sight without taking too much away from the game's visuals. Anyway, I'm not trying to defend the poor little 3GB 1060, I'm just noting it's a graphics card that comes with compromises in some titles. Moving to 1440p and now we find an extreme scenario where the 6 gb 1060 really struggles to maintain playable frame rates with just 8 gigabytes of system memory. Upgrading the 16 gigabytes makes a massive difference here, while increasing the system capacity further has no impact. Obviously the 3 gb 1060 is still a complete write-off with the extra quality settings in play. Okay, well I think that's pretty conclusive. I'd say for casual gamers, the bare minimum is still 8GB, but there is plenty of evidence to suggest the upgrade to 16GB will ensure smoother gameplay. For serious gamers rocking mid-range to high-end hardware, we're almost at the point where I'd say 16GB is the minimal acceptable amount of system memory. Of course, as I alluded to earlier, if you've invested over $1,000 US in your GPU and SSD combo, then chances are spending just shy of $200 to secure a decent 16GB DDR4 memory kit probably isn't something you're going to think twice about. For GTX 1060 or RX 580 owners who've spent around $250 US on their graphics card, dumping another $200 on DDR4 memory is something they're probably umming and ahhing about. If you're playing games such as Battlefield 1 or in particular Call of Duty World War 2, and you care about being competitive, then 16GB really is a must. Alternatively, if you have a relatively high-end GPU such as a GTX 1070 or perhaps Vega 56, but play older, less memory intensive games, then 8GB will no doubt be fine. But again, for these newer titles, you'll ideally want 16GB. I have to say, I found it somewhat ironic that for those that bought a 3GB 1060, and this, I'll admit, is a card that I have been recommending to budget shoppers, in order to get the most from it in today's games, you will actually require 16GB of system memory. So, by saving $50 on the GPU, you actually need to spend $90 US more on system memory. So that kind of changes my perspective on things a little bit there. Uh, I'm probably being a bit unrealistic as GTX 1060 3GB owners will probably play at 1080p with lower quality settings, and that will likely play a bit nicer with 8GB of RAM. Anyway, I've said many words in this video, and as a result, it's no doubt been very long. So apologies for that, but I hope it was worth it. In a nutshell, for today's latest and greatest games, 4GB is out of the question. 8GB is now, in my opinion, the bare minimum. 16GB is the sweet spot, and 32GB is still overkill. If you liked this video, and I sure hope you did, about a week's worth of testing did go into it, but if you did like it, then please hit the like button, and if you want to give me your thoughts, then use that rectangular box below, or if you're using the new modern YouTube, uh, click the line that just blends in with pretty much everything else. Anyway, type some words in there, and hit enter. Ah, uh, man, there's going to be so many comments now that just say words, or some words. <laughs> Anyway, if you like what we do here at Harbour Unboxed and you do want to support us directly, then consider checking out our Patreon account. The link's in the video description. Tim's recently revamped it with all new tiers, so if you aren't satisfied with just harassing me below in the rectangular box or the line, whichever your preference, then pay as little as $3 to have a direct link to us on Discord and speak your mind whenever you want. I'm your host, Steve. See you again next time.